Hey, John here again, and in today's orchestral recipe, we're gonna look at some Ravel. And uh, I've taken this 8 bar excerpt from Ravel's suite uh, Le Couperin, and it's the third, third one, the minuet from uh, the orchestral version. And I say orchestral version because uh, initially Ravel composed uh, six piano pieces. And for whatever reason, he only orchestrated four of them. And this is taken from the third one. Anyway, uh, what we'll learn from this one is some uh, cool woodwind writing, uh, some the VC string writing as well as uh, parallel parallel harmony. I think it's uh, it's a really really cool sound that you you won't be able to get with the regular regular uh, four part writing rules. So this is uh, uh, a great technique to be comfortable with. But uh, before anything else, let's just listen to it once. So here we go. Okay, and uh, well, we can start off by just looking at the orchestration. And uh, as you can see here, it's a condensed score again, used the focus uh, feature in Sibelius. Um, and we start with the melody. Uh, the main melody is in octaves actually, uh, it's flute as a top. And you have the bassoon one octave lower. So together they sound like. Okay. And uh, the notes, uh, the actual key here is G minor. And you can see that here, if you look at the uh, key signature, you get the B flat, which is minor third, and you got the E flat, which is the minor sixth. But uh, it's actually in G Dorian, because if we look at the harmony here, you got a regular E, which is uh, the natural sixth. And if you have a natural minor scale and you you uh, sharpen the sixth, or you use a natural sixth instead of a flat six, you get a Dorian mode. So basically, this is in G Dorian, which is a uh, if you're not familiar with modes, which I really think you should be, uh, but uh, I'm gonna talk more about modes later on. I think I promised that in another video as well, but I, I, I will get to it. It's really important, but anyway, it's you can see it as a uh, a brighter version of the minor scale. So, uh, and it's all the modes have their own sort of uh, sound. So, and it's a uh, it's a really useful thing to be able to use. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, so we're yeah the orchestration so it's uh we have the melody in flute and bassoon just see exactly the same phrasing and then you can see here just means that it's uh one flute and one bassoon dynamics are uh what you see here it's pretty low dynamics and that's uh really important for the flute because the flute is in a pretty low register, actually the lowest register it can be in. It's mainly within the, the lowest octave. So depending on the flute you have, uh, this might be your lowest note. I think there's flutes with one that goes down to B as well. Maybe even B flat. But I think to be safe, C is the absolutely lowest note. 
And uh, you couldn't really play this note uh, very loudly anyway, so the, the dynamics markings here are on point. But uh, that's to be expected, it's Ravel we're talking about, so of course. But uh, And then we have the, the accompaniment, if we could call it that, but because if you look at the the rhythm here and also the phrasing you can see it's basically uh, if you just look at the uh, the legato bow here with the legato, legato with the slur markings they're exactly the same and the rhythms are the same and the direct direction is the same so and that's because uh, <coughs> he used the par parallel harmony man I have a hard time saying that parallel harmony uh, to uh, harmonize this instead of using uh, whatever other techniques there are out there. But it, it's a very special sound and it's very easy to use once you know how to do it. And I think we're, before we, we look at the rest of the orchestration, I think we're going to look at uh, just quickly how. Whoops. Okay. So here's, uh, uh, this is from Ravel's or, uh, piano version of the same piece. And uh, as you can see here, it's basically, if you, what I want you to look at here is the same, it's a, exactly the same voicing <clears throat> that he just moves uh, with the melody. So so yes, don't worry about the actual note, just look at the spacing. So you get a melody note, <clears throat> and we're, we're disregarding this one because, but if, if we, this might look weird, you know, it's like, why it's, it's only three notes here, but if you look at the accompaniment here, this D would be here. So you actually have the same voicing here as well. It's just that the, the first note <clears throat> is in the, the bass note is actually above this note. But anyway, uh, so check out the, the actual voicings instead. So you have uh, the melody note and your gap of a fourth and then you get uh, uh, just thirds. So it's it's basically, uh, uh, if, if we view it from the from the top melody, it's, uh, it's a first inversion triad. So uh, if we go back to this one here, <clears throat> a bit easier to explain. So if, if we have the melody here, let's just copy. Like so, uh, so what he did to harmonize this was to do this, and he kept that interval going the whole time. So a fourth. And the third. Oops. Fourth and the third. So that's why it's called parallel harmony because uh, you simply decide whatever voicing you want, and then you 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 build that voicing from each melody note. Or you, you can even see it, I mean, like, this shape is sort of frozen, and then you just, wherever the top note moves, the the, the harmony notes move within the, the tonality. And uh, this is actually a big part of big band writing as well. So, but, uh, it's a it's a really useful technique and a guy I started with Leon Willett great composer uh, he he called this uh, shadows because he, he remembered looking at some John Williams scores and and uh, trying to follow the, the different voices because if you come from the uh, you know three-part writing and four-part writing you you sort of want each no voice to have its own uh, its own path 
so to speak. And he was really confused where it could go from that to suddenly you had like uh, six notes uh, for a while. And then you would go back to four or three. And he, he couldn't figure out what was the real voice. But so, so he... he uh, his theory was that it's it's mainly a, a way to thicken up a melody line, and that's exactly what it, what it's used for here in in Ravel's case, because it's it's really uh, it really has no separation from from the melody because it uses the same rhythms and and moves in the same same direction. But it's a uh, it's a great technique and it gives a very specific sound. Uh, the only thing is that you shouldn't. It, it's uh, it could be easy to overdo it if you do it for too long it can sound kind of boring and predictable but uh, you know using it for a section or two like this it sounds great and like I said before it's really easy to use once you know how to how to do it and uh, let's jump back to the orchestration here again so um, like I said it, it's it's the Dorian mode, and when it comes to modes, it's really important to uh, to solidify the tonal center. And in this case, it's G Dorian, so naturally we want to really <coughs> make sure that we perceive the G as the root note of all this. And to do that, uh, Ravel used uh, half of the cello section to play this which is a sustaining fifth like that so that really it's like a power chord it's really solidifies the G uh, as a root and also to add some more uh, movement he used a pizzicato pattern in the other half of the cellos and he also supplemented that with uh, a double bass uh, ostinato in harmonics and this looks kind of it's kind of misleading here uh, with our harmonic notation but it, if, you, if we just look at the two two first bars here you have you see that it repeats after that so it's two bars repeated four times so once we solve this, we know exactly what's happening here. And <clears throat> I'm gonna move on, uh, move over to the setup again to show you the actual pattern that the double bass is playing. And also the double basses are uh, in the VC as well. So there's only two of them playing this pattern. So the basic pattern that the double bass is, the actual notes that, it, that sounds are uh, D5. Going down to D4, and then going down to D3, uh, and all the way down to G2, uh, and then back up again. So this is the actual pattern for double bass. Okay, uh, remove that. So, uh, with all that said, uh, let's listen to the example again. And just try to uh, focus on <coughs> how, even though everything here moves in parallel, it doesn't sound wrong uh, that you know we're sort of taught to to feel that parallel intervals like fifths and octaves sound wrong, but it, it's just a matter of uh, matter of where you use it and how you use it. And it's uh, the rules are, are there to to uh, get you a specific sound. So. You would never sound like uh, Beethoven or Bach by doing this, but you could never sound like Ravel uh, by using 
the rules for Baroque writing. So it all comes down to when to use stuff. So with that in mind, just listen to this once more. Okay, so uh, the elements here are uh, obviously melody here, bassoon and, and flute. And you could view uh, the clarinets uh, either as just shadows of the melody, so sort of like harmonize the melody. So this whole thing would be melody. And <clears throat> uh, I'm actually going to view it like that because it's uh, uh, such a specific technique and also uh, you could view it as a sustained pad because the only thing that a sustained pad needs is that uh, there's a harmonic element that's sustained uh, and it doesn't mean that it has to be static it can move but it has to be it can't be any gaps in it because when you have gaps in a pad it will turn into a rhythmic pad uh, and I, I will make videos about all these different elements later on but I think you'll learn a lot just by <coughs> hearing me talk about it as well so the melody is one element obviously and uh, I view this as part of the melody but here's a very clear sustained pad and these two are part of the same uh, bass ostinato. So we got three elements. We got an ostinato. See. <clears throat> that. And then we have the melody. we can do this here melody again <clears throat> and then we have a uh, see sustain pad like so so does not always these two and sustain pad here and we got melody melody and this one like I said, you can see view it in two different ways, either as part of a pad or I will actually do it like this. Because really it's uh, on its own, this wouldn't sound like a melody. Uh, so uh, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a pretty, but it's a, it's part of a pretty specific technique. So, whatever you want to call it, it's fine it, because it's uh, it doesn't really matter in this case. And also here we have this is I would view this as part of the part of the ostinato really when it comes in. So that's basically it for the elements in the orchestration. And <clears throat> let's just go over to the setup example there again. Okay, so uh, let's just listen to the piano version here once. Okay, and uh, that's basically it for the original version. So what I did to uh, make my own was I started with uh, the melody that I wanted and I did this in E Dorian instead. So I came up with this melody. And 
that I th I knew my mode already. I knew that it was E Dorian, so I knew that the the base line here should represent uh, E uh, very strongly, and then I simply tried out different. Uh, uh, harmonizations of the melody and it was kind of easy because I, I sort of knew that I wanted to have uh, this uh, fourth sorry this inversion going through the whole thing so that's basically what I did uh, and also I knew that I I wanted to have the melody in octaves as well so I simply added the, the the correct triad below each note, and the only only place where I I I uh, strayed from this exact same voicing was uh, I found that when you have a when you have a scale like this, uh, let's say uh, let's do it in in C major. go from the top like that and then we add uh, everything below it so we harmonize this with a fourth below and then a third so that's fine but here's the problem this didn't sound right uh, and I thought about this, what it was, and what I came up with what was that uh, uh, in every other case, you just keep doing this. Okay, so if we, if we listen to this, uh, actually we start over here. Hear this one, and why this one sticks out a bit uh, is because the interval between the melody, which is the top note, and the the next, uh, well, the first uh, harmony note, is a fourth, a perfect fourth there. But between B and F. We get a tritone, so it sort of sticks out, and it, it did as well here, uh, because it, if I were to follow the the ori original pattern here, I wouldn't have a, an A. I would have to use a D, and that sounds weird. If you listen to this. I didn't like that, so... So what I did was that I, I just kept the, the same note here. So if we look at the melody here, we got the D, which is a fourth up, and then we got the C sharp. So. I get the second inversion instead of the first. So I was, uh, would have gotten, and it sounds. I think that what it sounds like it, it's it's kind of reminds us too much of uh, four part harmony because of this. It's very uh, Beethoven esque. It almost sounds like one, five, one. Uh, so it kind of sticks out in this uh, more floating kind of harmony. I think it's maybe because it's, it's, it's too leading. So by doing this, uh, and it's, I mean, it, it's, it's just a note of the, of the scales. So it's nothing, uh, we're not doing a, anything strange here. We're just exchanging. Uh, one note for the other, so, and it, to my ears it sounded better, but uh, when you try this out for yourself, 
whatever works for you, just keep it. So there's really no rules here that you have to keep the same shape uh, because you don't, you know. And um, so anyway, but what I came up with, uh, let's remove this. Uh, was that uh, I, I came up with the melody and I already knew that I wanted it in, in octaves and then like I said I just picked the shape that I wanted and kept that shape going and just follow I followed the the scale I was in and I knew why I was in E Dorian so it was pretty simple to it was super fast to do. So once I had the, the melody here it was really easy to, to harmonize it. And the only thing that I had to sort of uh, change was this thing here with the voicings because of the reason we just looked at with the, the tritone so for, for some reason to my ears the tritone uh, sticks out uh, a bit too much but uh, that, that's up to you but uh, so the whole thing sounds like this on the piano Okay, pretty simple. And uh, the orchestrated version is basically the same as uh, Ravel's. And the only thing I added was this uh, Celeste line. Uh, because uh, another thing, I, I, I didn't use the overtones for the double bass. Uh, it's a real hassle to notate in Sibelius, to be honest. And I wanted to try something different and see if I could get the. Uh, a similar result without copying it. I mean, doing a carbon copy of it. And but I, I by adding this Celeste uh, line, which is basically uh, elements-wise, is just part of of this. It, this is basically the same. This is part of the same uh, sort of idea. Uh, same thing here, uh, cellos in Divisi, fifth, it worked great, so why change it? Pizzicato for the other half and Pizzicato for the double bass here. And I, I think uh, note performer, I mean, just because I write in the beginning of this score that it's two double basses, it, it doesn't really... Uh, differentiate between that so but I mean it's it's all an approximation anyway with with all these uh, mock-up things so I don't think it that makes that much of a difference but uh, otherwise besides that I, I use the same exact orchestration I just uh, used my own melody and uh, the results sound something like this and just for fun I can try changing this one to to have the same you, you probably hear that it doesn't sound that good Well, actually, it wasn't too bad, so... But I, I preferred this one, anyway. Okay. So, uh... To sum it all up, uh, to use this sort of parallel harmony, come up with a melody, uh, know what key you're in, and uh, try the different shapes below your note, and uh, just experiment until you, uh, and feel free to change any pattern 
uh, during the melody that you don't like because uh, I mean it's uh, totally up to you and there's no strict rule that you have to stick to the same pattern it, actually that's one of the, the things I, I read in a uh, great book Vincent Pichetti's 20th century harmony I think it's called where he <coughs> actually said that the problem with this kind of writing is that it tends to get kind of dull after a while so to counteract that you could try different stuff like <clears throat> maybe have a bass line that moves uh, in uh, contrary motion to <clears throat> sorry contrary motion to to the harmony and the melody and stuff like that so just mix it up as as in any way you like but it, it, it's a very specific sound and Turns out it's it's not that hard to to emulate this sound if you one uh, know your scale so you know where you're at what notes you can use and also you you have a uh, you have a firm grasp on your uh, inversions of uh, and positions of the triads so you have something to uh, try it out with uh, so you don't have to go you know, trial, trial and error all the time. So, uh, hope this helps. And if you have any questions, as usual, just uh, shoot me an email through my website. And you have my website uh, below this video and also in the channel info, this Crafter Composing channel. And uh, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll keep doing this. Uh, every week. So uh, have a good one and talk to you soon. Bye bye.